University and her PhD at the University of Virginia. Dr. Taylor is a prominent, award-winning historian of the American Civil War, and she is Theodore A. Hallam Professor in History at the University of Kentucky. She will tell us about the amazing story of how thousands of slaves made the journey to freedom behind Union Army lines during the Civil War, with special focus on those of the Carolinas. Based on research supported by the American Council of Learned Societies and the National Endowment for the Humanities, her talk is drawn from her most recent book, Embattled Freedom, from UNC Press, which has won awards from the Organization of American Historians, the Society of Civil War Historians, and the Center for Civil War History. The book also won Yale University's 19, uh, I'm sorry, Yale University's 2019 Frederick Douglass Book Prize, a very prestigious, highly coveted award. Dr. Taylor is also the author of The Divided Family in Civil War America, and she is involved in a variety of public history and historic preservation projects. She is co-editor with Stephen Berry of the Uncivil War series with the University of Georgia Press. And she has served as editorial advisory board member of the Civil War Monitor magazine and a past member of the board of editors of the Journal of Southern History. So she has quite a few laurels uh, that she wears, to say the least. Also, her husband, Dr. Scott Taylor, is an excellent and accomplished historian and a fine man. As <laughs> the husband, it's true. <laughs> As I'll the husband, that. also of a, a very uh, you know accomplished uh, woman myself, I like to get in. I like to balance. Myself. And on the tip top of all this, Amy is a super mother to two awesome, thriving daughters. Uh, are arguably the greatest in the universe today, <laughs> objectively speaking. And I say that they're they're uh, teenagers now, or in the mayor, so that's that's saying a lot. Uh, and through it all, she's a really good person. <laughs> and, and I'll add here that she is, uh, just in the last uh, few weeks, she has given talks in New York, uh, Richmond, Virginia, Philadelphia, the University of Illinois. And here she is at, at our wonderful library here in Pauley's Island, the Waccamaw Library. So let's, let's welcome Um, what Dan didn't mention, it feels a little bit like a homecoming coming here, although I've only been here maybe three times in my life. Um, you know, being born with the last name Merle, you feel a special little kinship to a place like Merle's Inlet, but um, Dan knows my husband and kids because we all used to live in Albany, New York, and our kids were babies together, that's how we first met, so coming back and seeing his family, it's like a little homecoming too, so thrilled to be here. Uh, today, so thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the library for having me, and what a great crowd this morning! Wow, it's a rainy day. Perfect time to come to the library, right? <laughs> so, okay, I will try to deliver it here. Uh, I am here this morning to talk, as he said, about the Civil War, um, but about the end of slavery and how it broke down during the American Civil War. So I'm here to talk about emancipation. Now, this is a subject that we all probably have some familiarity with already. Or at least there's a story that Americans usually tell about emancipation that is very pretty familiar to us already. And it is one, you can also see it on the screen on the side if that's a little bit better. Uh, the story that's so familiar to us is I believe <coughs> captured by this image. This is a painting done by the artist Francis Carpenter in 1864. Francis Carpenter went to the White House, spent some time observing Lincoln, and he depicts here a meeting between Lincoln and his cabinet members in which they're talking about the Emancipation Proclamation and first drafting it and, and talking about how it was going to play out. So this is the story really that we often tell. Emancipation is the story of Lincoln. It's kind of a one-man story. It is a story of how, with his Emancipation Proclamation, 
Freedom came on January 1st, 1863, and freedom came to all. Uh, freedom was granted to all. Well, this is a story we usually tell, and it's a very important one, and I'm not here to diminish Lincoln and the proclamation at all. There's a lot that's very important about it to the whole story. Um, and it's, you know, rightfully revered, that document in our history. I grew up outside of Washington, D.C., and I can remember as a kid going to the National Archives and seeing the Emancipation Proclamation, which I think they only bring out a couple days of the year because it's so faded and can't really see the light. <clears throat> so that's all well and good. But in the course of becoming a historian, I also began to see uh, other images of the Civil War era, images that were taken by photographers who were coming into the South from the North during the Civil War. They were taking images and sending them back North, and they were images to me that didn't quite square with the story of Lincoln and emancipation. Images like this from Port Royal, South Carolina, were like this from Helena, Arkansas. Images of clusters of housing, newly built clusters of housing, erected inside the lines of the Union Army. Not to house soldiers, although they were certainly building winter quarters and houses for soldiers, but in these cases, this is housing um, meant to be the residence of an estimated 500,000 men, women, and children who fled slavery during the American Civil War. I actually can't see my notes. <laughs> I hope you don't mind if we go just a little lighter. <laughs> Although, I'm fine, I don't need to, to look at them too much. Um, but housing an estimated 500,000 people who fled slavery and sought protection in Union lines and effectively refugeed themselves from slavery in the Confederacy. And the term refugees was used at the time. I can talk more about that. Uh, but these images, to me, didn't quite square with the story of Lincoln and emancipation uh, because these were not images of freedom that was simply given and realized overnight. Uh, these were images of people who were risking their lives. Oh, perfect. That is great. <laughs> who were risking their lives and under some of the most dangerous circumstances during this incredibly destructive civil war were going out and trying to claim their freedom. These were images of people who found that, that uh, freedom didn't just come to them. They had to go out and get it. They had to go out and secure it and live it and search for it. And as I said, 500,000 people did it, which is about one-eighth of the enslaved population in 1860. So pretty significant portion, I think so. Um, well, as I came to realize that the story of emancipation was more complicated than the one I had grown up uh, learning about, I began to ask why why was there this massive dislocation of people fleeing, uh, sometimes very long distances, in order to claim freedom? Why did this have to happen? And most significantly, how was it lived and experienced? You know, what is it like to go from slavery one day to going and living with an army for sometimes four years with your children? What is that life like? So those are the questions that were behind um, the book that Dan mentioned that uh, came out in late 2018, Embattled Freedom. And it's a book in which I aim to tell that fuller story of emancipation. Um, it's not the story of how freedom was promised to the nearly four million people who were in slavery in 1860. It's instead the story of how they made that promise a reality and how emancipation actually worked day to day uh, during the American <clears throat> Civil War. And so, today I thought I would just tell you a little bit about that fuller story, share you some, with you some glimpses of uh, what I write about in the book. And the story begins very early in the war, surprisingly early to me when I first began looking into this history. Very early in the war, what I mean by that is actually the first days and couple weeks of the war in April 1861, when enslaved people in various parts of the South began leaving their plantations and fleeing in large numbers and going to where they could find the Union Army. So Fort Pickens, Florida was one place. 
Uh, Washington, D.C. was another, and Baltimore, Maryland, was another, and also the coast of Virginia by Fort Monroe. Well, this was a pretty remarkable thing because they had been given no direct signals by the Union that the Union was going to encourage them or um, allow them to stay in Union lines. In fact, Abraham Lincoln himself had said just the opposite during his campaign. In his inaugural address in 1861, uh, Lincoln promised that he was not going to interfere with slavery where it already existed in the South which meant he was not going to get involved, okay? He's not going to encourage people to run away. And Lincoln said this in part for a number of reasons. It was political, but also legal. He did not believe he had the legal authority and constitutional authority to interfere with slavery in the South. In fact, the laws at the time compelled him to do just the opposite. If, he, if the federal government um, or any federal official encountered people who were running away from slavery, the federal government was compelled to turn them back. This was, it's in the Constitution. It's also the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, which was passed um, as a way of appeasing the South at the time. And what it did was it empowered the federal government to return runaway slaves to their owners. So these were the laws on the books, and the Union is fighting a war to defend the laws of the United States. So there were no signals coming from the Union that those who were running away uh, would be allowed to stay. So it's a pretty remarkable thing that they went anyway. Well, so what happened was there were a few cycles in all those places I mentioned where people would run and the Union would turn them back, would expel them, you know, don't come into our lines. And this happened for the first six weeks of the war until the end of May, 1861, in Fort Monroe, Virginia, along the coast by Hampton. Um, something different happened. Again, a group of enslaved people from Hampton showed up at Fort Monroe. This time they met with the commander of the fort, who was General Benjamin Butler. Butler, who was no abolitionist. There was really nothing in his past to suggest he'd be sympathetic to enslaved people. But he listened to the people who arrived. And the people who arrived made an argument to him. They said, um, listen, allow us to come into your lines, offer us protection from being returned to slavery, and we will work for the Union. And not only that, you're, it'd be taking labor away from the Confederacy. Because the Confederates are, are wanting us to work for them. Well, Butler, he wanted to win this war. You know, again, he's not really an abolitionist, but he wanted to win the war, and he found that to be a persuasive argument. So Butler listened. He said, okay, you can stay in Union lines. And he issued an order requiring his men to allow any enslaved people who subsequently arrived to stay. And he said, he justified it legally by saying they would be known as contraband of war. <laughs> contraband of war, enemy property. He reasoned, well, if the Confederacy views them as property, we will too. <laughs> and in a time of war, we can seize enemy property. So that's legally how we're going to justify this. So he issues an order that he, it does not free anybody exactly. It kind of creates this new murky position for them. But it does say that enslaved people can come into the lines. Well, this would establish a really important precedent <coughs> for the Union. <coughs> And um, let me get my light going here. And it was one that would open the floodgates, almost literally. Um, over the next four years of war, as I said, 500,000 people would flee to the lines of the Union Army. Over the course of the war, Union policy would change, and eventually the Union would recognize their freedom. That's what the Emancipation Proclamation would do. But well, two years before the proclamation, we have tens of thousands of people who have already come into Union lines. And it all started, this is a map where I documented where a lot of this was happening. And it starts, you can see the coast of Virginia, and it goes down the coast to the Carolinas. Um, that little cluster there, let me see if I can use the pointer. Yeah, there we go. This little cluster here, you might recognize that. Beaufort, Port Royal, uh, Hilton Head, and uh, Edisto Island. Uh, were places where they were congregating. 
and then it moves across the border states and down the Mississippi River Valley. If you are familiar with the military history of the war, and you know where the Union Army moved and what parts of the South it occupied, I think you'll recognize this is the basic footprint of the Union Army in the South. Uh, because that was the single most important variable here determining whether somebody could flee and uh, remain protected from slavery. They had to have the presence of the Union Army there. So that's uh, roughly where these places were. Um, sometimes they went into Union-occupied cities, like Nashville. And I'm going to show you some photographs. These are actual photographs of these encampments of former slaves that I'm going to show you here. Uh, this is Nashville in a burned-out building. Or sometimes tent cities. They created tent cities, um, like this one here on the edge of Richmond, Virginia in 1865. But very often, all this was happening in former plantation regions. And a big plot of land that once was a plantation worked by enslaved people now became transformed. It started to look a lot different and became a place where people were envisioning freedom. Uh, this is Camp Nelson, Kentucky, near where I am in Lexington. Uh, that was a big plantation, and then these houses were erected. All right. Um, just to give you a sense of how some of these plantations could be transformed, one example from Norfolk, Virginia was known as the Taylor Farm. It once housed 11 enslaved people in 1860, but a couple years later, there were 1,000 people living there in 200 newly built houses. So how differently uh, a plantation could come to look. Uh, people called them contraband camps, some of them, but there was a real movement in the Union to start using the term refugee and to call these refugee camps. There were uh, people in the Union who were sympathetic with the, what was happening with these people, uh, white people in the Union who were more sympathetic, and they said contraband, this is a quote, is not a term fit for a human being. And to recognize their humanity, refugee was a better term. It uh, was a term that captured also their sort of indeterminate state, their sort of their status as they are moving towards citizenship, a recognized citizenship, and they were fleeing what they believed, uh, or they were fleeing slavery. Um, in and around the camps, as people showed up, they started working for the Union Army just as those original people promised Benjamin Butler. They did heavy labor, <clears throat> building military roads, digging trenches, burying bodies was a big part of the work that uh, some of them did. Uh, women went to work as cooks. They worked as laundresses. Men and women, more men but some women too, sometimes were able to bring <clears throat> the knowledge they had of the local area, particularly the local landscape, and they worked as guides for the army, guiding the troops around. Some of them worked as spies. They were able to convey information that they had gathered from the Confederacy and to give it to the Union. And for the first time in their lives, they were promised wages by the Union for their work. Now that's a whole story in and of itself. Wages were not always forthcoming. Uh, but they were, to some degree, and they were certainly promised, and they were certainly um, demanded by those who were doing the work. Um, all right. Some of the camps, it's just kind of a light light here. Yes. I might have to get my reading glass, though. Um, some of these camps were very transient. Uh, this was a very transient existence. Um, those, I showed you some in the Mississippi River Valley. They tended to show up kind of right on the riverbanks in some cases, and so we're very vulnerable to floods. Uh, the Union Army at one point <coughs> decided that the islands in the Mississippi River would be a great place to locate refugees from slavery um, because they would sort of get them out of the way, isolate them, protect them. Um, but there's a reason why those islands were not inhabited before the Civil War. And as you might expect, pretty much all of them were, um, oh, that's good. All of them uh, were flooded out at one point or the other. But what also made this a very transient experience uh, was just the winds of war. And uh, the, if active combat was in the region, enemy troops might show up, forcing an evacuation of a camp. Or sometimes the Union itself decided to pick up and move 
forcing a sudden evacuation. So this could be a very um, uncertain and, and uh, turbulent experience for those who were making it into these camps. But in some places that happen to be more removed from active combat, less vulnerable to floods, less vulnerable to anything that could force an evacuation. In those places, what started to happen was what you see here, the emergence of a more permanent uh, settlement, something that started to look more like a village or a small town. That's Camp Nelson, Kentucky. Um, one other example of one that was more removed and became more stable was on the land of General Robert E. Lee in Arlington. So the Union occupies his land, seizes it, takes possession of it, and before it becomes a national cemetery, um, it is the home of Freedman's Village, which was the name given to one of these refugee settlements. And you can just see from this 1865 diagram that uh, it was being designed at a certain point to be more permanent with parks, uh, there's schools, there's um, you know, the pond in the middle there, the streets, and so forth. Or here is a photograph of Freedman's Village, Virginia. Is yeah? any of that left today? Or is it not in Freedman's Village. Actually, pretty much everything I'm showing you today, there's not any physical structure left. But I want to show you one a little closer to home here in South Carolina. Mitchellville. Anybody heard of Mitchellville? Okay, a few of you on Hilton Head Island. Okay. Um, so I'm not a local, I'm not sure how people describe various parts of Hilton Head Island. I would describe this as the northeast end uh, near the airport. Okay, you're nodding, thank you, good. Um, so a part of Hilton Head where indigo, sea island cotton had been grown and cultivated by enslaved people. Well, what happened was uh, in the fall of 1861, so that first year of the war, um, that sort of land devoted to slavery suddenly became transformed. And what happened, if you know the military history of the South Carolina coast, and particularly Hilton Head, is that the Union came in and overwhelmed the Confederate defenses there along the coast. And uh, in this particular case, they overwhelmed Confederate troops commanded by a man named uh, General Thomas Drayton, who was a landowner there on Hilton Head Island. So they overwhelmed them, sent the Confederates fleeing. Uh, Drayton himself went to command troops in Virginia and later in the Western Theater. But some of the landowners on Hilton Head and the other islands around there uh, started fleeing as well and going to the upcountry. So they, in effect, became refugees too. <coughs> Um, some of them took enslaved people with them, but many enslaved people remained behind. And so what that left on a place like Hilton Head Island were Union troops and enslaved people, or formerly enslaved people. <clears throat> and so it became a magnet for enslaved people from a greater part of the region along the coast of South Carolina, and even some from the upcountry, started to make their way to the coast. Because the coast became identified as the place to go if you want to claim freedom during this war. So what happens um, here on Hilton Head, this is Drayton's land, General Drayton's land, actually becomes the site of where a refugee settlement um, appeared. And uh, for about a year, it consisted of tents and a barracks. Uh, the people went to work for the army, again, doing heavy labor, cooking, and so forth. Uh, some missionaries from the north, from organizations like the American Missionary Association and the New England Freedmen Aid Society, they started coming down onto Hilton Head um, to help, to help establish schools, to help establish churches, the things that this formerly enslaved population wanted most in their first days of freedom. They're trying to build a new life. So the missionaries come down, and uh, they're living for about a year, but it becomes pretty clear that this is going to be one of the more stable locations, not entirely, but um, a place where a more permanent settlement could be created. And so in October 1862, uh, that starts to happen here on Hilton Head Island. And what you see is a diagram here of what is ultimately created there, beginning in October 1862. So they put, in, they put in roads 
They make a grid pattern there. There are schools and churches. In fact, there are three churches um, and four stores as well for food and just household supplies and things that they need. <clears throat> and um, it gets a name. And in this case, the name is it's Mitchellville. It's named after a Union general, General Ormsby Mitchell, who had come in to command this region uh, but contracted yellow fever. And in October 1862, when they started this process, he died. And so it was a tribute to him uh, that it was called Mitchellville. So uh, one thing to notice in this diagram, though, and this is up at uh, the National Archives today. It's actually oversized. I want to say it's like six feet wide. It's a really big um, diagram or map. Um, you, you can see those little dots along the roads. Well, those are the houses that are being uh, erected here. And each one gets about a quarter acre of land. So they're carving up the land uh, for individual families. Well, this is a process that um, the union officials in the region, the white union officials, the, the army officers, as well as the missionaries, they get very um, interested in the process of building more permanent houses for the refugee population. And what they really care about is building small houses that would each house one nuclear family, mother, father, and kids. And they deliberately make them small. None of the houses at Mitchellville, and I'm going to show you actually a photograph now, were more than 220 square feet. So these are small houses. Here's a photograph there. And this is something that, um, again, they get very fixated on. Um, and this is not just in Mitchellville, but in some of the other parts of the South where these more permanent villages are popping up. We see white officials who want small houses for nuclear families. Um, as a white chaplain in the Mississippi Valley explained it, quote, each family should be put by itself as far as possible in one hut. And the huts kept distinct and separate from each other. So what, what is this all about? Why do they care so much? Well, a lot of these white officials, in, in this case, in the first year of Mitchellville, when it's just tents and barracks, looked out at this refugee population and saw a lot of crowding. They called it huddling and jumbling, in the words that they used. And to these white officials, this you know, challenged their sort of public health ideas. You know, they felt crowding would you know, spread illness and so forth, which is true. Um, we're talking about that a lot these days. Yeah. Um, but they also felt that crowding a lot of people in one place was not good for cultivating the qualities of a good citizen in this population. And that's what they're really thinking about. They're thinking like, you know, this is a population that's going to become citizens. Maybe they need to be taught how to be citizens. I mean, this is in their head, okay? I'll give you the perspective of the refugees themselves in just a moment. Uh, but this is what they're saying. And in their minds, the small nuclear family is like the, the school for learning how to be a good citizen or developing certain values and characteristics. It's in a small nuclear family that you learn about duty, you learn about loyalty, uh, you learn basic morals. And so they felt that we need to break up all this crowding and put them in nuclear families so they will develop the right qualities of being a good citizen. So they're using the space to bring about a certain kind of social order. Well, this would remain a source of tension between these white officials and the refugee population. Because the refugee population, it's not that they wanted to be crowded and spreading illnesses and all that kind of thing, but oftentimes what the white people were seeing as crowding was not really to them. They were seeing these camps as a place where family they had long been separated from were now reuniting. And it was a place where they could pull in everybody that, who was meaningful to them. Um, because enslaved families often didn't conform to a nuclear family structure. They often couldn't if the slave trade got in the way and sold somebody away. And so extended family was very important to this population including people who were maybe not blood relatives, but came to be like kin. And so 
they wanted to have all of these people with them and didn't want to necessarily segregate out into nuclear families. So this would be a source of tension. Um, but in Mitchellville, the officials did some other things that were interesting to try to cultivate certain kind of citizenship. Oh, because of my voice. I'm <coughs> yeah, I'm a little congested, I guess. But I don't mind. It doesn't hurt or anything. All right. So um, thank you. All right. So in Mitchellville, they do a couple other things. Military issues orders um, about governing Mitchellville. They want Mitchellville to become what they call a self-governed town. So they issue orders at one point, dividing this village into districts. And each district is going to represent or vote and elect a uh, representative to serve on a council that is going to govern Mitchellville. And the council is going to establish schools, you know, deal with you know any sort of crime or conflict. They're going to levy taxes. Um, they're going to clean the streets. You know, a lot of things local governments uh, still do today. And the idea was that this would be like a way of rehearsing and practicing governance and being a citizen before the nation then acknowledges the citizenship of uh, African American people. And for good measure, the military also issued a compulsory education law that children had to go to school, which has been called South Carolina's first compulsory education law. I haven't fully documented that, uh, but certainly it's very early. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Again, Mitchellville was one of the more stable settlements, and I, I mentioned how in some places they never had the time to build houses even like this because they're constantly having to evacuate and be on the move. That's especially true in the Mississippi River Valley. And so basically, just surviving this experience becomes um, really the central challenge to seeking freedom during the war for this population. And so that's another thing that I explore in my book is how do they survive? How do they do it from one day to the next in this militarized environment? And um, to explore this, in my book, I study the experiences of some particular individuals. Because I kind of felt like if you follow an individual through time, that's when you start seeing like, all the subtle day-to-day -day things that they have to deal with. And that's what I really wanted to wrap my mind around. Now, as you might expect, if any of you, I mean, you all are library people. Um, I bet some of you have done research. You've done some genealogical research, maybe. And um, you may know that this is a population that didn't leave behind big, extensive, first-hand accounts of their lives. They didn't leave two volumes behind like Ulysses S. Grant did in, um, in his memoirs. They didn't leave the huge trove of letters and speeches that Lincoln did. So how do we do it? Well, fortunately, um, I discovered early on that even if they didn't leave behind their stories, they show up in the records of other people, in particular, the Army's records. And what I discovered early on, and other historians have too, it's not my original discovery, but is that um, the Army was meticulous in its record keeping during this war, which kind of surprised me that they would have clerks with these like big ledger books that they're lugging around as the troops are moving. And in beautiful handwriting, um, recording everybody who comes into the lines, recording any time somebody received a food ration, recording who did what work what month and how much they were being paid, I mean everything. And so I looked at things like, I'll just show you some examples. Here's a clerk's record in Virginia of people coming into the lines. The clerk interviewed each person coming into the lines to get their story. Um, here is a record book of laborers hired to build military roads in central Kentucky with their name, um, what days they worked, where they were from. And I will say that column on the right, that's actually their former owner's name. Little quirk of Kentucky. Kentucky was like the last state where freedom came. That's one way to put it. And um, the union was starting to use the labor of enslaved people before it was willing to uh, acknowledge they might be free. Um, this is well after the Emancipation Proclamation. And initially, the union was going to send the money they made back to their owner. This is after the Emancipation Proclamation. It's a very complicated story. I don't need to get us off track here. Um, 
registered. So here are regimental records of uh, black regiment, the register of deaths, what people were dying of. I mean, just all sorts of records. And if you've ever done genealogy, then you probably understand then what I try to do. I um, position myself as I describe it like a follower, and I started following individuals as they show up in these records, and started connecting the dots of their journeys, and trying to figure out in each case why they show up where they do, and what might they have been doing. And pretty soon their story started to come alive. Um, and so I thought I would <clears throat> share with you just a brief glimpse of a couple of the stories I tell in the book. And I have to do something really embarrassing here in a library. Um, I didn't bring a copy of my book today. <laughs> I just failed to. But I have it on my computer. <laughs> but trust me, it is, it is in hardback. Like, it exists as, and I prefer that. So I'm a little embarrassed. But anyway, um, I want to read to you just a paragraph each about two different people I, I talk about in the book and just tell you a little bit about them. The first one is set, um, and neither of them are set in South Carolina, but I'm coming back to South Carolina, I promise. Um, this one is, the first one's set near Fort Monroe, Hampton, Virginia, September 1861. It was just four months into the U.S. Civil War, and this once thriving coastal town seemed on the verge of collapse. Charred stumps occupied the places where mature trees once stood. Lone chimneys rose above the burned out ruins of houses and stores and churches. And once grand homes looked nothing like they did weeks before, having collapsed into piles of bricks. And yet, amid all the rubble and ashes, Edward and Emma Whitehurst saw more than a town destroyed. They began rolling barrels of flour into one of the abandoned buildings and dragged in bushels of potatoes. They placed pigs in the side yard to be fattened up and ready for slaughter, and as the late summer heat bore down on them, got to work baking ginger cakes. In these moments, this husband and wife, enslaved from the days they were born, but now miles from the white man who claimed to be their owner, became storekeepers. And if they could make a go of it in this war-ravaged town, if the Union soldiers and other people like them seeking freedom from slavery were willing to come inside and buy their goods, then they could sell their way into a new life as free people. So I tell the story of Edward and Emma Whitehurst. Um, it's, a, it's a long and complicated story. I did find that, you know, I was surprised. Becoming a storekeeper wasn't really the first thing I thought of that somebody right out of slavery would do. But of course, you know, they've got to build a livelihood and make money. I mean, that's foundational to freedom. And it turns out Edward Whitehurst had been what was called a hired out slave during or before the war, which meant that his owner hired him to other people to work. And sometimes in those situations, he was allowed to keep a cut of the money. And he did, and they had $500 uh, when the war came, probably saving it to purchase his freedom, which a number of enslaved people did. But once the war came, he didn't have to buy his freedom, so they invested it in the store. And so I tell their story. It's not a simple sort of linear line to freedom and progress, because what happens is not everybody around them was respectful of their right to own property, the property in the store or respectful of their right to keep the return on their labor. And uh, they would face a particularly difficult moment in the late summer 1862 when the Union Army it is just defeated in Virginia. They were trying to take Richmond in the Peninsula Campaign, but they're defeated, sent packing back down to the coast of Virginia. And these hungry, demoralized soldiers burst into the store, and they empty the whole thing leaving the Whitehurst to start all over again. But I won't tell you anymore. I'm not going to give it away. Um, the second story takes place in Helena, Arkansas. So this is Phillips County, which is right on the Mississippi River. Mm. Nearly two years later and over a thousand miles away, this low-lying town on the western bank of the Mississippi River had been continually deluged. If it wasn't the flooding river waters which left knee-deep mud along the town's streets, then it was the arrival of thousands of Union troops to occupy this cotton trading town, as well as the intermittent appearance of Confederate forces firing on the area from passing riverboats. Eliza Bogan, a woman who had spent her life harvesting cotton under the threat of the lash on a plantation just northwest of town, was now left to figure out if she could safely remain and call this place her new home. She spent her nights in a crudely built cabin that had a roof and a door but no floor to protect her from the river muck. 
Her husband had been sent hundreds of miles away as a new soldier in the Union Army, and her seven children remained back on her old plantation under the surveillance of their enslaver. Illness raged, and death claimed the lives of one in four people in the tents and cabins around her. And now rumor had it that the Confederates were making inroads again, closing in on Helena and the nearly 4,000 freedom-seeking people who had taken refuge there that year. So she, um, her story is really one about physical survival and how it could never be taken for granted, and how her pursuit of freedom, like many others, required getting involved in combat and actually literally fighting for it. Uh, she'd become a laundress for a uh, regiment. It was actually a regiment that, went, that her husband uh, joined. And she then migrated down the Mississippi River Valley uh, with the Union Army. She would go from, from Arkansas to Louisiana, to Tennessee, to Mississippi, to Texas, to back to Arkansas, and witnessed all sorts of active combat. She was vulnerable to violence, and uh, also, as many laundresses did, she basically became a nurse as well, informally, and nursed many of the men who fell ill, including her own husband, who was struck down by measles during the war. Leaving um, her basically, you know, for the rest of the war, she's trying to find security for herself and her family, but ironically is doing it by getting deeper and deeper into the war. And uh, here's a story, quick story, from, oops, okay. From South Carolina, a similar story to Eliza Bogans. Has anybody heard of Susie King Taylor? One? Okay. Um, you can access her reminiscences online at the University of North Carolina. Uh, Susie King Taylor, she was actually enslaved in Georgia, but she made her way to the South Carolina coast. She was one of those who came from a distance uh, here to uh, find freedom. And like Eliza Bogan, she attached herself to a regiment as well. It was, it was the first. Initially, the first South Carolina Volunteers, a black regiment, um, it became the 33rd USCT. And um, she, what she did later on in life, this is in 1902, so she survived the war and lived on, she wrote her memoir um, and published it. And uh, it is, as far as we know, really the only published first-hand account of an African-American woman in the Civil War. So really a valuable thing, and she tells a lot about what was happening here on the South Carolina coast, so I highly recommend it. Okay, I'm not going to go on too much longer, um, but I do want to kind of tell you what happens. So I want to conclude here by um, what happens to these spaces, what happens to these camps. And this is a big question at the end of the war, because, you know, as we've talked about, some of them are becoming pretty permanent spaces, like Mitchellville. You know, these are places where people are coming and they're envisioning, this is the future, this is where I'm going to stay, this is where I'm going to build a whole new life. Um, and yes, in a lot of these places, I mean, illness is, is running through. I mean, they're very much like the refugee camps we hear about today. Um, they're not the greatest spaces in the world, but they were places where people reunited with family, as I said. They're building churches, they're building schools, they're building a whole infrastructure of a new life. Well, what happens at the end of the war is that a lot of these spaces are on former Confederate lands that the Union has either confiscated or the Confederates abandoned. So confiscated and abandoned lands were what they were called. And the Union at the end of the war has to figure out what to do with this land. Uh, should they give it back to the antebellum Confederate owners as like a gesture of sectional reconciliation? Or should they carve it up or allow, A, allow these settlements to stay, and then carve some of the rest of it up so that some of these newly freed people can either rent it or purchase it. So that's the big question. Initially, the union is sympathetic towards carving the land up. Uh, you may be familiar, well, I'm sure you're familiar with the name General William T. Sherman. <laughs> okay, around right here you are. Um, in, you know, he, he has his famous march to the sea, and, uh, he, while he does this, he meets with some black leaders in the area who convince him that this land should be opened up um, and made available for renting or purchasing by black people. And so he does issue an order, a famous order, special field order number 15, that is going to carve up 400,000 acres of land along the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida into 40-acre parcels. 
that will then be made available to newly free people. You've heard the phrase 40 acres and a mule. That's where it comes from. Um, and then, you know, the union creates a new Freedmen's Bureau. It's a new federal agency that is going to over help oversee the transition to freedom after the war. And its job is going to be to kind of facilitate that carving up of the land and making it available. Well, this was all well and good while Lincoln was alive. After his assassination, though, we got a new president, President Andrew Johnson. And as we know, with new presidential administrations, things can change. And this, things changed. Um, Andrew Johnson proved to be far more sympathetic with the former Confederates, and uh, he decides the land should all be given back. And the Freedmen's Bureau, instead of overseeing the process of carving the land and redistributing it, is now supposed to shut down all of these settlements and evict the people from the land. Kind of a 180 degree shift in its founding mission. Well, the people in these settlements are not gonna go quietly. And I want to share with you to conclude here uh, what the residents of Edisto Island did. They um, got together, had public meetings, trying to strategize what can we do to save this land. And they eventually write a letter to President Johnson with their arguments for why they should be able to rent or purchase the land. And uh, one argument they make is they say, well, these white landowners are land monopolists. There's a land monopoly that these white people have. And they said land monopoly is injurious to the advancement of the course of freedom. Because they knew that if the land went back to these former Confederates, the Confederates were probably not going to lease it or sell it to them. They were going to hold on to it. That's why they called it a monopoly. And so they said, quote, if the government does not make some provision by which we as freedmen can obtain a homestead, we have not bettered our condition. Like, freedom's not going to mean much if we don't have a homestead. Then they say, we are ready to pay for this land. Shall not we who are freedmen and have been always true to this union have the same rights as are enjoyed by others? In other words, why are you respecting the rights of former Confederates? We've been loyal to the union this whole time. Or as they say, are, are not our rights as a free people and good citizens of these United States to be considered before the rights of those who were found in rebellion against this good and just government. Well, the letter did not persuade Johnson, and uh, only in a few exceptional cases did the Union hold on to this land and allow some of these settlements to remain. The land of Robert E. Lee, they didn't give back. Same the land of President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy in Mississippi. So the, the two kind of figureheads of the Confederacy, the Union was willing to kind of make them pay um, and uh, kept their land. There were, in most other cases though, these settlements were cleared out, sending the people to go start over somewhere else. There were a few other small exceptions and interestingly, Mitchellville was one of them. It's a long story how, um, and maybe in the Q&A, I can talk a little bit about it, uh, but the land was not reverted back to the white owners until 1875, 10 years after the war. So the settlement stayed for 10 years. And when the, the Drayton family got their land back, by that point, they were ready to offload it. And so they did sell some of the land to some of the African-American residents of the town. And so this is why today you can go to Hilton Head Island and you can go to what's called Mitchellville Freedom Park, which some of the descendants and residents on the island uh, created. Um, it, it opened in 2010. It's actually still being developed and built, um, but it is a wonderful spot. It's a very unique one in the country that is trying to preserve one of these spaces that were created during the war and educate people about this history that so many people don't know. So I'll end on that note. I think their work is critical. I think this is a part of Civil War history that has um, been overlooked for too long, and it tells us a lot about how freedom came in this country, which is a pretty significant part of our history. So, thank you very much. How about some, uh, some questions for Dr. Taylor? Do you want me to call him? Yeah. Okay, I'll call him. I saw you first. Okay, then I'll come over here. First of all, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, where does your passion come from? 
<laughs> um, I don't know, except one of the things I love about history is the unknown and the sort of mystery of it. I, I went to college as a math major, actually, and not history. I actually thought history was really boring because I, it was presented to me as this like settled set of facts that you just memorize. Um, and it wasn't until I had a really amazing professor in college who alerted me to the fact that there's so much we don't know and there's still a lot to be discovered. And um, that's the part of it that really excites me. And um, I've often said if I wasn't a historian, I would be a detective <laughs> or a journalist who does like investigative pieces, you know, really kind of digs out what we don't know. Um, so, sort of an answer. Um, you have a question. Do any African Americans live in the Mitchell Hill? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. In fact, um, <coughs> they're the ones. Um, and, you know, and many of them are descendants of people who were there during the war. Um, they have been leading the charge of making sure this history is not forgotten. And um, other descendants around Hampton, Virginia, have been doing something similar. Uh, Alexandria, Virginia, and uh, over in Helena, Arkansas, too. We can associate with it because so many of the African Americans in this area have lost their land. <laughs> you know, to Which is a long history, or a long story in our history. But we can, in this, what I talk about today, we get a glimpse of that struggle to hold on to land and how important having land is for everything else. Yeah. As I looked at the pictures, I was taken by how they all had so much clothing. Mm. Hmm. How did they how did they get clothing and, and also food in good question? Times? So <clears throat> because and, and that speaks to you need those things to survive, food, clothing, and shelter. Those are kind of the, the big three. I talked a lot about shelter, but not the other two. Um, clothing, I mean, some of it was brought with them. They didn't have a lot to bring with them. Um, and in fact, I mentioned you know, missionaries coming from the north. So what happens is some of these um, missionaries and just other kind of benevolent people in the north start forming new Freedmen's Relief Organizations. So a lot of these are people who were abolitionists, and now they're kind of turning their abolitionist energy towards providing relief. And they, they start sending barrels and barrels and barrels and barrels of clothing to the South. And um, the Army transports it from the North, particularly over in the West, the Mississippi River, but along the coast too, um, free of charge. Like they don't charge these organizations. And the organizations, um, they're, it's largely used clothing, people <laughs> donating it from the North. And um, so some of the stores that are created, like in Mitchellville, have this clothing. Some of it's given away, but some of it is purchased. It, it kind of varied a little bit. And there were some points of struggle over that. I read about a woman in Helena, Arkansas, who was originally from Massachusetts, a white woman, who was in charge of overseeing the distribution of this clothing. And then she looks at some of the clothing, she's like, wait, that's like what an elite white woman wears. It shouldn't be worn by her. And so you can see how some of them still, you know, the white people in the North have these sort of racial ideas too about how people should look and dress and, and so forth. Um, and food comes largely through rations from the Union Army. Um, the Union Army, when they agree to allow them in the lines, commits to feeding. The rations are less than what a soldier gets. So not always adequate and have to be shared. So that's why many um, in some of these places, they desperately want land for a garden. Um, which, and then there's some heartbreaking stories in the Mississippi Valley. They got their garden going and then here come enemy troops, they gotta evacuate and they don't get what's in their garden. So uh, there's a lot of hunger that goes along with this story as a result. Um, but there's a lot of tenacious, you know, sort of activity to make sure that the whole family can be fed. Yeah. yeah. Um, I get the comment. I, I'm impressed with the fact that, um, in spite of the fact that as we got closer to the Civil War, education for slaves became more and more restricted, in, as in non existent or outlawed, uh -huh. um, as well as the fact that we did have a tendency to ignore the huge amount of skills that enslaved. African Americans had both in terms of construction skills, I mean, they mm -hmm. these beautiful buildings and, mm -hmm. and other stuff. Mm -hmm. And it looks to me almost, and that's why I got it as well, um, that the generals and those, and those folks who were 
almost intimately involved with these refugees or countries or whatever, um, realized the extraordinary innate intelligence and skill levels that these folks brought with them. And so we're, you know, they, they use yeah. that, that those skill levels to do yeah. things even better for for their uh, prospects yeah. as, as military. Well, that's, I mean, that's definitely true. And there are many union officials who are expressed, you know, gratitude for this person can do this for us and this person can do that for us and use their skills. But which is not to say that some, I mean, some of these union officials, they share the same racial assumptions and racism of some of their southern counterparts. Um, and so some of them are also not very appreciative, too. There's that part of the story. But, but absolutely, yeah. Yes? Have you studied uh, President Johnson's uh, attempt to reverse the uh, outcome of the Civil War? And how that pertained to his impeachment, and the uh, still the dampering effect it had on the hopes of the war. Yeah. Well, I just get into really one piece of his story, which is this whole struggle over land. Um, but that's really kind of embodies generally what he was doing, um, which is being incredibly conciliatory towards the South. Um, he's a really interesting figure because he starts out, you know, he's from, he's not from the plantation elite of the South himself. You know, he kind of built himself up uh, from pretty humble circumstances. And he starts off wanting to punish that particular class of people. Um, and the big mystery is like, why does he then switch? You know, why does he, because initially um, he was going to pardon those Confederates except those who had a certain wealth or value. And th those people had to do a special process where they had to like come meet with him personally. I mean, he was gonna make them beg, basically. Um, and he eventually starts giving in to them. And, you know, there's some mystery there, but um, I think, you know, I think race has a lot to do with it. He was just never on board with the federal government taking responsibility or having uh, responsibility for easing the transition to freedom. And he did not want the federal government involved in that. Um, so, so, but I, I, I mainly focus on the land piece of it. But he's a really intriguing figure, that's for sure. Yeah. John, yes. In the education in these refugee settlements, with the, the from teachers coming from the north and being yeah. trained, yeah, black teachers or how? yeah. So, how did the education work? Well, first of all. Um, and this kind of gets back to your comment about the skills that they brought. So there were always some enslaved people who could read and write. And maybe they were taught, but some were self-taught. And there were ways to teach oneself how to read and write. And so there are always some in almost every place that had that skill already. And a lot of schooling started with their own informal efforts, you know, teaching a group of people here, teaching a group of people in their cabin here. And then it's later that these northern organizations come in and start formalizing this process, and, and they bring a lot with them. I mean, they bring books, you know, they bring supplies. You cut, there are some things you need to really educate, you know, adequately. Um, they bring the money that helps build some of the school buildings. Um, and they bring teachers as well. And um, some of the former slaves be, get on the payroll of those organizations as formally as teachers. Um, a lot of the teachers also are just white people from the North, too. And it's an interesting story how those two groups work together um, to teach. But uh, it really is a striking thing. That is one of the first things somebody out of slavery is, is wanting. Uh, they want that literacy. They want to read it, right? They want to read the Bible yeah, for themselves. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes. Was the Confederate Army as thorough in record keeping as the Union Army? Well, you know, um, they were pretty thorough, but a lot of Confederate <laughs> records were destroyed with, at the end of the war in Richmond. Um, not all of them. And you can go to the National Archives today because the Union did seize a lot of Confederate records. And uh, those are still there, but there's a lot that's missing, which is not really their fault. Um, I mean, the Confederate Army, you know, a lot of them were trained the same way 
that the union men were at West Point and so forth. And so, you know, a lot of their procedures were very similar. So, yeah. So, yes and no is the answer to your question. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, at this point in time, how is Robert E. Lee viewed um, mm -hmm. you know, now that more information and facts have come out? So, you talk about in 2020 or back in the 1860s? 2020. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, how, I, I guess it depends on who you're talking about, by historians or by the public. I think... Um, I like factual. I like factual kind of... In other words... Yeah. I know there's, there's anger. I know, understand yeah. that. Yeah. But, but yeah. The fact... The historians, what we're trying to tease out about Lee um, is, you know, the question about him and slavery. Uh, what did he really think about it? There are stories about... Um, he and his wife freeing slaves, maybe he was actually secretly anti-slavery, and then there are other people who come, but there's this example of what they did to this enslaved person that, you know, doesn't seem to be particularly anti-slavery. Um, so historians right now are kind of working with his papers and working with what bits of information we have and trying to sort that out. Um, and another question about him is, um, you know, he, when he resigned from the U.S. Army, um, you know, he says he's going to go back to Virginia, he's got this loyalty to his family and to Virginia. Um, some historians see other writings of his from the time and say, well, it seems like he was kind of fully on board with the Confederacy, too. It wasn't just about his family. Um, so that's another one we're trying to sort out. And, you know, every year there are new books written um, with different perspectives on him. I think, I think, most historians would say he's an interesting figure. He's, he's complicated, yes. okay? Um, and that's, I think sometimes in our sort of public conversation, we oversimplify some of these figures and he gets pretty oversimplified. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Arlington uh, and our local historian, I mean, we had a fabulous history teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and she explained that he was torn. Mm -hmm. That, and I, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. trying to figure out what was I taught and what is the truth. That's where I, that's well, why I think Well, the thing, is, the thing is, there is no truth right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe someday we'll decide there is, but there's still a lot, with every new writing about him, it's sort of reigniting some of these debates about why he resigned or what kind of slave owner he was, what did he think of slavery. Um, so, I mean, that sounds like so academic of me to say, like, there's no truth, you know? But um, it I think sense. it's yeah. one of those things about the past that bears continual reinvestigation, and different people are going to bring different assumptions in reading his material and are going to interpret them differently. So um, I, there's not, the, the, the thing that you were probably taught about his loyalty to Virginia and his family, and this is why he resigns, yes, is still it alive and well out there. But it was yeah. a real struggle for yeah. you. Yeah. But that he didn't want to fight against his family. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, yeah. that, you know, going to war against his own yeah. family members was just, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, he's got some letters where he says that explicitly. So, yeah. you know, it's still alive out there as an interpretation. Yeah. 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 Just remember that, you know, to a certain extent, we're talking about a huge amount of value property and people when I guess when push comes to shove being being extraordinarily successful in this which which a huge amount of the of the movement of the government in ownership was it was was predominant. I mean losing losing one's property, especially a productive property environment automatically means, man, you can protect that. I mean, that's, number, that's probably number two or number three on Maxwell's list. I mean, you know. Well, it's part of why some people fought really hard yeah. in that war. Yeah. Is your hand going up? Yeah. Thank you, man. Uh-huh. I have a situation you might be able to help me with. Okay. Oh, 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 oh please don't film me. <laughs> please. <laughs> Um, <laughs> concerning the question about Robert e. Lee and history and interpretation and all those words that were thrown out with respect to that question, <clears throat> what one was taught, all that stuff, 
Um, they not, they are no teenagers in here today, I don't think. However, um, in your discourse, you mentioned white people a lot. Mm -hmm. Then you mentioned African American. Mm -hmm. That's African American with respect to history. That's a serious concern for me. Maybe you can help me because I understand slave, mm -hmm. I understand black people, the term mm -hmm. Negro and some other terms. Mm -hmm. African American with respect to history, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. I, I was here, of course, I'm old enough to have been here when yeah. the Civil Rights Act was passed and all that stuff. When I put my name on the dotted line to go to the military to go to Vietnam, I had put Negro, African American. I think it's an issue because many times the young people to hear such a talk as yours in the schools and stuff, so they're thinking African American. If history is not factual, I think there's a problem. I mean, you might be able to help me, I don't know. So, so is the term factual? Huh? Is the term factual, is that what you're saying? Like, should we be using this term to talk about black people in the past? Yeah. Exactly, every time yeah. you mention yeah. a couple of races here, yeah. white people. Yeah. Perfect. Well, here's the thing, you know, as a historian, we can't just speak in the language of the past. Um, because, I mean, there's some language of the past that I saw in these sources I would never repeat, <coughs> right? So we, we kind of struggle sometimes. Um, we want to respect the past and the facts and how people spoke and understood their past at the time. But some of it, but we also kind of wrestle with our 21st century sensibilities and my unwillingness to say use the N-word you know, in, in public. So African, so I think my use, I mean, my use of African American is much bigger than, than me. I'm sort of following what, you know, many of my peers, fellow historians do. Um, and we use it as a term that is uh, respectful of the Americanness of this population. Now, some people would say you shouldn't use that before the 14th Amendment granted citizenship. Um, I think that's open to some debate, but uh, I mean, I, I appreciate what you're saying about staying true to the past. Um, I think with language, though, it sometimes becomes a little difficult when we have moved so far beyond some of the language of the past. I appreciate you. And I, I understood the respect element in what you were doing. Um, and I understand what you're saying about this 21st century stuff, but I, I, personally, I, I believe in reality. Mm -hmm. What that white person said to me yesterday, for no reason, because I passed him on the highway, he pulled beside me and he said some things, uh -huh. that's real. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. to me, it's totally ridiculous to be going around saying the N-word. What are you going to say? Say what it is. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, that's white person. I'm not going to do that. That's just me, okay? Uh -huh. That's just me. Yeah. And <coughs> I have a certain, a certain uh, respect <coughs> for what was created for the creator, and I'm not going to be derogatory to the creator. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah. So I don't have an issue with race. Like, I truly don't. But. I have an issue with the accuracy of historic representation. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, that's a good issue to have. And um, I mean, I welcome debate, and I think any historian would as well. And I think um, everybody should have that sort of issue and, and bring it to bear, and not just accept at face value what they are told and what they read. So I appreciate the spirit in which you're, you're asking. Please, ma'am, one other thing. See. And then we got one other hand over. Okay, I, I, I'll shut up. Now. No, that's okay. Is it quick? You see, once 
we, we start sweeping stuff under the rug. Yeah. People misunderstand. Mm -hmm. Then they want to take down the Confederate flag. They want to destroy a monument. Hey, that's not me. Leave it there, leave the money. History should be what it is. I mean, that's just me. So once you start doing those kinds of things, yeah. people do not understand. Understand is very important. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe yeah. they understand better than me. That's why it's only me of my race in here today. I don't know, but it's, to me, it's, I, I don't get it. Well, I mean, that's why I say I need some help, please, man. Yeah, no, who can help me? Preservation. I'm, you know, I, I I'm with you on generally. More of us need to appreciate and preserve the past. History. So, history, yeah. Well, the past is another way to put it. Yes, ma'am, I understand. Yeah. Okay, where's the question over here? Yeah. So, um, it, especially in this area, in, in the last, I don't know, 10 years or whatever, um, there's been recognition of the enslaved people as Gullah Geechee. Uh -huh. So is that a better term to use? Than well, that's, I mean, that's referring to a particular group of people along the coast. A lot, well, actually, a lot of people I'm talking about today. Why? Isn't it most? No. 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 Yeah. But absolutely, but good you, term to use. For, but, but then are you not lumping the Galabici in with these? Well, I mean, any anytime um, you're so you're talking about a group of people, there's going to be so many things that differentiate them. You know, then, I mean, if we keep deconstructing that, then suddenly it's hard for us to even talk. Um, I mean, historians face this all the time. You know, we talk about particular groups of people, but really some are living here and some are living there and some are of this class and some are of that class, and there's a lot that differentiates them, but at a certain point, there are some commonalities. And um, those commonalities are worth pointing out. And so even though this population, and I, I didn't get into everything in my book today, um, even though this population is a diverse one, um, there are some common threads of their experience that I wanted to bring out in my talk today. So, but without being disrespectful of, of difference. Yeah. You, one more. you had a couple of slides that had the unit designation USCT. Yes. What does that stand for? United States Colored Troops. That was the official um, designation of um, when Right, so this was uh, black regiments when um, the federal government, when the Union Army incorporates them, they give them that numbering system. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much.